Good morning, everybody. I hope that you had a good week. You know you had to have had a good week because you're here today. It's a good week that we got up this morning and you are breathing and you have a sound mind. I'm looking forward to worship this morning so that we can praise and worship the living God, Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They've got a new song on now that plays on Air One, and Sean just came up with it, and it's a thousand names. Can you imagine all the names of Jesus? And every one of them is worthy to shout. So, get ready. What an opportunity we have to come together on these hot days of summer. We just got one more month of August. And then we'll start to wind down. I love fall. Fall is one of my favorite time of the year. September. It may be burning hot during the day, but you know those nights? How many remember the nights cool off in September? And it was wonderful. So we are just one more burning hot month of August. So we used to call it, how many remember the old school name, Dog Days of Summer? You ever remember that? Yeah. It's like they just drag on and on with the heat. So a lot of people out of town today, uh, our youth, our students are coming back down the mountain. Woo! They are done, uh, actually they're leaving right now as we speak. The bands are loaded, they're coming back down the mountain. They were there just immersed in it. They had Thursday night service, Friday night service, Saturday night service. So a lot of good things happened up there. How many know the more that you stay soaked in God and you soak in God and you praise God and you lift up His name, that things happen. Amen. I heard the other day, and I've heard it before, but what a reminder that your future will be determined on the words that you speak. Sure. The way you talk, that will actually determine your future. So how thankful we all can be that we're going to be praising God today, lifting up the name of Jesus. Is His name worthy to be praised? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thank all of you for being here today. It's uh, an exciting time for me. I always look forward to Sundays because we all get to come together and we get to do what we're going to be doing for eternity. We're going to worship God today and get used to it because you're going to be worshiping God forever and ever and ever once we leave here and we're in heaven. So while we're here, we're going to taste this side of heaven. When we get to heaven, it's going to be out of this world. It's going to be amazing. So let's just worship God today, this morning. And I know that this is a time that all of you understand. It's a time to get equipped. It's a time to praise and worship God. It's a time to get re-energized. How many had to get gas in your car last week? Let me see who got. How many put gas in your car last week? Oh man, you must have electric cars. You put gas in your car, and it's biblical to come into a place like this and to fill your tank. The Holy Spirit is not just a one-time filling. It's a over and over and over and over. And I'm so sure thankful for it. Because sometimes I'm not too proud to admit I need some gas. I need the Holy Spirit to lift me up, to empower me. So let's get empowered today. Let's worship the true and living God. And you know when you do that, you never know what can happen. You can get healing. You can get set free. You can have so many things happen. And you praise and worship God because He comes in this place. Father, I just thank you today that we're all here together. We're as a family, the body of Christ. And Father, we look forward to lifting your name, your son's name, praising and worshiping you today. And I ask for safety as those students, I think there's 19 of them, Father, they're coming down the mountain. I pray for safety as they're rolling down to come back to church here to be reunited with their families. And we just pray that what happened up there, that they'll be able to testify, give glory to you, and that even youth students would have a calling that would come on their life while they're up there on that mountain. God, that they would just be able to have things revealed to them that no one here on earth 
earth can reveal that you are Father in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Before we sit down, just to give thanks and just a little bit of music in the background. I just, I want to give thanks to them. Don't you, don't you just want to give thanks? Lord, we give you thanks for our family. We give you thanks for our satellites. We give you thanks that we are able to breathe. God, we give you thanks for the refuge that you've given us, the, the homes, the apartments. Father, we give you thanks for the cars that you've given us, for the gas that you provide so that we can drive them. God, we give you thanks for our families. We give you thanks for your promises.
when you know something was going bad and I ended up escaping something, I said, man, I'm lucky. It ain't luck. Just like any one of you, it's not luck, it's God's grace on your life. And that's why Jesus Christ came to have grace and mercy on your life. Um, God, God didn't come initially um, to be a judge. You know, he's coming back. You better watch it when he's coming back. You better get right and be right when he comes back. Yes. Amen. Yeah, we all got a story. No doubt. No doubt. But are you giving, are you giving God the glory? You know, that, that's kind of the difference. So who, who are you giving the glory for what's happening in your life? Amen. I'm going to open up with prayer. I always like to open up with prayer. Father, we come before you right now in the precious name of Jesus. Father, help us, God, put ourselves down, Father. Help us, Father, lift you up. Holy Spirit, prepare our hearts. Father God, I come against you. We power every principality, God. Father God, every spiritual wickedness, God, will try to hinder us this morning. Try to hinder us from your word, Father God. I break that assignment, Father God. Father, I declare this to be holy ground right now, Father God, in Jesus' name. Father, fill us with your spirit, God. Fill us with your word. Fill us with boldness, Father God, to tell somebody, to seek out, Father God, those that are lost, Father God, just like you did. You came on a mission to seek that which was lost. And that's the mission we're supposed to have, is seek those that are lost and not be judgmental, but reach out our hands, reach out our love, reach out with mercy and grace to those that don't understand mercy and grace, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. I sanctify this place, you know. Um, I wake up every morning, I walk outside, and I kid you not, um, you know, I wake up in the morning, I do my thing, get ready for work, I go outside, I look around, and I just take a deep breath, and I smile, and I say, man, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you that I can walk freely outside. Thank you that I can walk freely to a car. Thank you. Even if I was taking a bus, I used to think of anyways. I took a bus for a minute, too. So I didn't always have a car. You know, in fact, I didn't even have bus money sometimes, man. Some of you, I don't know if you know where Muscoy is. Muscoy? You know, it's over here. You know, I rode my bike from Muscoy to Garuba for a year. You know, I mean, I got on that thing and I took off. You know, for a whole year I rode my bike. I had to go to work. You know, and I went. And I did it. Sometimes I hated it. I admit it. And other times I liked it. It was cool. I had a job, so I was going to it. And then one day the manager saw me rolling up on my bike and he goes, What are you doing? I said, what are you doing? I'm going to work. He goes, No, why are you on a bike? I go, That's my mode of uh, transportation right now. He goes, No, 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 we gotta fix that. He helped me get a car. He helped me get out of it. It was you, it was you me, you know. And it was a little second, a little moment, and, and stupidity, pride, whatever you want to call it, I almost sort of, no, nah, it's cool, man, I got it. You know, we get like that. When somebody wants to bless us, somebody wants to help us, we do those things. No, I'm cool, I got it. I can handle this. I, I got it. I don't, need, I don't need any help. And that's stupidity, and that's pride, because God wants to love you. God wants to love on you. God cares about you. He's all a father. He wants you to do anything and everything he can to help you. Get along, to move on with our lives. That's why he came. Amen? For those of you who got a Bible, uh, we're going to start off... Oh, hang on a second. I can't see. Where am I? Oh, Pastor, okay. No, I'm just kidding. I can see. Okay, we're going to uh, John... I'm going to start it off. Uh, John 8. I'm only going to have three scriptures. It's going to be John 8. And we're going to read from 3... To 11. And the scripture says, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have accused him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And he stooped down again, and wrote on the ground. Then they which were heard it, being convinced, convicted by their own conscience, went one out by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. 
and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus lifted himself up, he saw none but the woman. He said to her, Woman, where are those? Where are those thine accusers? Where are your accusers? Have no man condemned you? She said, No man. No man, Lord. No man. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I mean, the Bible says she was caught red-handed. I don't know if any of you have ever been caught red-handed, got caught in the act. I mean, you ain't going to deny it. You can't get away from it. You got caught. Somehow, some way, you got busted. And you got caught. There's no way out of it. You can try to lie your way out of it. Oh, it's not really like that. It's not really what it seems. It's not really what it looks. She got caught red-handed. And then at any time, Christ had the opportunity to condemn, to hurt, to cast away, to punish, it was here. Because he caught her. They, they dragged her in there and they put her in front of him. You know, you gotta remember the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, the scribes, the Pharisees here, these guys were the elite at that time of religious leaders. These guys were the ones that knew the law, especially the scribes. The scribes were the ones that wrote documents, things like that. They drafted different items for, for, the, for that time. So they knew the law. That's why they threw the law in Jesus' face. The law of Moses says, if we catch such a person, she's got to get stoned. She's got to die. She's got to die. You know, but check it out. How many have you ever heard the phrase growing up? Dios te va a castigar. Te va a castigar Dios. That means God's going to punish you. You know, moms, dads used to grow up telling us that all the time. Every time we did something wrong. God's going to punish you. God's going to get you. Don't be doing that. So we grew up with this mindset that God's up there with a big old hammer, like Thor, getting ready to pound on us when we do something wrong. So we grew up like that. You know, and those things are instilled in us. You know, those words are instilled in us. And we grew up like that. We start thinking, God is this huge God that's going to hurt me. That's going to put me down. That he's not love. That he's not mercy. That he's not grace. Because it was so instilled in me. That's why it's important for you to come to church. That's why it's important for you to read. Listen to the word on the radio, on a, on a podcast, or whatever you got. Listen to the word. Listen to it. you got to understand who Jesus Christ is. He did not come to condemn the world. That's not why he came. The first time when he came. He came to seek that which was lost. He came to save us. You know, even if you ask Christians, save you from what? What did God save you from? Um, he saved me from drinking. He saved me from going out on my wife, going out on my husband. He, you know, that's what they say. But you know what he saved me from? The wrath of God. That's what he saved me from. The wrath of God. You need to know that as a Christian, Jesus Christ came to save you from the wrath of God. But there's going to come a time when Christ comes back as a judge. He's going to come back with wrath. He's going to come back. And he's going to take care of those that rejected him. That's what he came. So you don't reject him. Don't reject right. Don't reject that function that's going on inside you to get right, to do right. Like, listen to this. It says, in verse 9, it says, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience. And that's what the Holy, Ghost, the Holy Ghost does to us. The Holy Ghost is not going to slap you down. The Holy Ghost is going to present to you what's wrong. You gotta make that choice. You gotta free will. You gotta make that choice to say, man, I don't wanna do that. You know, I'll give you a case in point. Years ago, when the Holy Ghost came into my life, you know, he literally, he literally, it was like watching it on TV screen. I saw my life in kindergarten, in first grade, in second grade, in third grade, all the way up until I was 21. Because that's when God reappeared into my life when I was 21 years old. I literally saw myself all those years. I saw myself in kindergarten taking a toy from another kid, picking up sand and throwing it in his face. The back then there were sandboxes. It was to play. I did that. Grab the toy, threw him down, threw sand in his face, kicked him, and and all the way through school. You know, back in the day they used to have these um, envelopes on picture day. You know, all the kids would come, put the envelopes by the classroom, and go out and play. So we my homies would walk by and you know start picking up all the envelopes with all the money in it. You know. I mean, I did that. You know, be pushing people around in the bathroom, taking stuff, and God showed me. My life was flashing right before me all the way up until I was 21 years old. 
Always. All everything I've done. All the all this stuff I've done. Everything. But you know what? Check it out. When I was seeing that, I only saw me. I didn't see my homies. I didn't see my crying me. I didn't see anybody else except me. You know why? Because when you stand before God, it's just you. It's not you and your parents. It's not you and your friend. It's not you and your spouse. It's not you and your best friend. It's you. You're accountable for you. You alone. You're going to stand before God on your own merits, whatever you did or didn't do. So when I saw my life flash in front of me, I said, wow, I'm a bad person. Because up until that point, I sincerely did not believe myself to be a bad person. Even though I was hanging out in the neighborhood, even though I was gangbanging, even though I was carrying a gun, even though I was doing robberies, even though I was doing all kinds of crazy stuff, I did not consider myself being bad. How, how is that even possible not to consider myself being bad? Because I didn't have a conscience. I wasn't consciously aware of what was going on. I just reacted. I was just living in the neighborhood. If somebody pulled a gun out on me, I'm going to duck and shoot back. That's what I did. If somebody did something, I'm going to go get them. We just lived that life like that. So I didn't have a conscience. But that day, that day, God showed me all this stuff. And I said, wow, I'm a bad person. I didn't realize I was a bad person. And check this out. That's what it says here in this verse. Their own conscience convicted them. Jesus just presents stuff. The presence of the Holy Ghost, the presence of Jesus Christ, will do some kind of supernatural impact on your life. That's why you got to get right with God. That's why you got to get filled with God. That's why you got to have a constant filling with the Holy Ghost. So when you walk to school, when you walk to work, you walk into the store, you go get gas, somebody's going to walk up to you and say, hey, there's something different about you. I don't know what it is, but something's going on. Something's different about you. That's the Holy Ghost. That's the presence and the power of God. That's when you're supposed to stand up and say, let me pray for you. You know, I don't know what's going on, but God knows what's going on. God is letting me know that there's something going on. I need to pray for you. You need to, you know, you know, you might even have to be casting out the devil at that moment. You never know. It happens. It happens. It's happened to me. You know, you go walking up to somebody, you start talking to them, all of a sudden, they're like, ah, you start getting all crazy. I'm like, what? Who is this? Man, I just want to pray for you. You know, but they're acting all crazy. So that's when you gotta come and shut up, come out in Jesus' name. You know, you gotta do that. You take authority. That authority is that you have, the power of the Holy Ghost is in you. Don't take the spiritual life lightly. We worship God in truth and we worship Him in spirit. You can't you can't necessarily worship God because you're giving money. I know people say, oh, it's a form of worship that you give. I, I agree to a point. But you worship God in truth and in spirit. Your life is what God wants. Your temple is what God wants. Your soul is what God wants. You know, your money, God, God really don't care about your money. I mean, he can snap his finger and bam, there's a bunch of money. I mean, he sent one of the disciples to go fishing. He got a fish with a big gold coin in his mouth. I mean, he can do stuff. So that part is irrelevant. But you, you are special to him. You are special to God. He wants you. He wants your soul. He wants you in heaven. That's why he came. He didn't come to punish me, punish you, you know? When you do something wrong, just get up and shake it off and say, God, I'm sorry. And go on. Don't, don't kick yourself in the butt. Don't, don't sit there and beat yourself up all week, all month, all year, whatever. Next thing you know, you're not even going to church. Next thing you know, you're not even doing a Bible study. Next thing you know, you don't want to hear about God. You don't want to hear about it no more because you did something wrong. You said something wrong. You went somewhere where you shouldn't have went. That's why you shouldn't have went. You know, and because you go somewhere and you do something, something bad happens. So what do you think? Well, God's punishing you. No, those are consequences. There's such things as called consequences, repercussions for the things that you do. That's just natural. That's a law. Just like the law of gravity. You throw something up, it's going to fall down. It's the law of gravity. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. So don't think just because you did something bad, God punished you. It's the consequences of what you did. You know, you go out and you rob somebody, guess what? You're going to jail. You're going to go to jail. You may be saved, but now you're in jail. Now you're a saint behind bars. You know, there's consequences. It's not so much that God punished it. You know, if you did that, you did that on your own. That's, that's one of the biggest maturity things that we got to do is come to that point where we look in the mirror and we say, what did you do wrong, Angel? What are you doing wrong? What can you do better? What haven't you done? You know, how can you critique your life to be better? you got to be better. you got to be more Christ-like. you got to, you know, reckon yourself dead to sin daily. you got to mortify your flesh. 
Your flesh is the one that wants to rise up. Your flesh is the one that wants to keep you out of church. Your flesh is the one that wants to keep you from reading. Your flesh is the one that wants to keep you from calling somebody and encouraging somebody. Oh, they don't care. They don't want to hear from me. Oh, that's my call. They didn't answer. Call again. Call again. Call again. You know, call again. You got to keep doing it. That's what the Holy Ghost did to you. You think it took one time for you to get right? You know, I, I have this. I did some research. And I have this under good authority that everybody in this, in, in this building right here, all of you have sinned. Correct me if I'm wrong. You all have sinned. Uh, each and every one of you have sinned, you know? So there's no way, no how, you should be the one pointing your finger at somebody and saying, oh, look at that. No, you should be pointing the finger at yourself. First and foremost, check yourself. Get yourself right. And then you can walk over there in peace and shalom and wholeness and wellness. And you can change somebody, encourage somebody, help them come up. Because that's the kind of life that God gave you. He wants to give you life. He didn't come to give you death. He didn't come to kill you and kick you down. He came to give you life. He came to give you life. Don't believe your neighbor, your friend. Don't believe anybody else other than the Word of God. God came to love you. Think about that for a second. Is there anyone here that was, that was born before the Bible was written? Anybody? Okay. So if the Bible was telling you that all have sinned, guess what? They were talking about that before you even got here on earth, man. So all this stuff here they knew. Don't you don't you know that don't you realize that God knows, that God knew that you're gonna sin again? That you're gonna cuss again, that you're gonna drink again, that you're gonna slip again? And I'm not condoning those things. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying go out and do it. Because you start drinking, 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 you start driving, guess what? You're gonna smash your car into something. You're gonna kill somebody. Now an innocent life guy. You know why I would drink? One of the reasons why I would drink. The last time I drank. Last time I drank any alcohol was, was it? it was like 1991 was the last time I actually drank any alcohol was in 91. And would have been that if I did that. I said, I'll have one. And I drank. Because everybody else was drinking. You know, so I go, oh, I'll have one. How stupid is that? But that's what I did. But the reason, one of the greatest reasons I don't is this. If I'm sitting there pounding down some coronas and I get a phone call, and like, hey, brother, can you come home and pray for me? How's it going to seem? How's it going to look, man? If I, if I roll up to someone's house and I'm breathing them alcohol and I'm going to pray for them, I'm going to pray for you. How's that? What's up with that? They're not going to receive. They're not going to receive well enough if I go down there drunk, breathing them alcohol. That's why I keep myself in check. That's why I got to stay right. I don't want to be caught like that. Then what am I going to do? Um, I can't because... Um, um, I'm going to look up an excuse. You know, I'm start lying. You know, first I'm being disobedient. I'm not going to go pray for somebody. Now I'm starting to lie. See how that slippery slope is? Not serving God. That's those are things that happen. You start accumulating bad stuff. You start accumulating a bad habit, a bad way of life. There's no peace in that. You know, the most miserable person in the world is somebody who knows God is not obedient. That is the most miserable person on this planet. Is you know God and you're not being obedient to God's word. You're not being obedient to God's will. Now I know you're all asking yourself, how could I possibly know that? Because I was one of them. That's how I possibly know that. Because I knew God. You know, let me share this with you. This is a, a, one of the craziest ones. I was a youth pastor. And I got discouraged. So I wanted to go have a beer, go have a drink all by myself. Where nobody knows me. You know, there's nobody around. I can just sneak in, and look like a, you know, look like a homeless guy, dress all crazy, walk. Nobody's gonna know me. You know, so I'm gonna do that. So I ended up going, and I ended up start drinking, and I ended up not drinking that one day, but I ended up drinking that whole week. And I ended up meeting this guy. His name is Stevie Amador in Colton. I met this guy. And not once did I mention, hey, I'm a, I'm a Christian, God loves you, God can save you, God can change your life, God is good. I didn't say any of those things. I kept all that to myself, and I started acting a fool with him doing that, right? By the end of the week, I was so miserable, so convicted, getting slapped around by the Holy Ghost, man, bad. And I repented, and I'm crying, and I repented to my pastor, and I'm telling him what happened. And, and that Sunday after church, I went to his house to go look for him. 
I went to go look for him that Sunday. So I go to his house and his mom and his sister go up. He goes, oh, you're an angel. Oh, you're that Christian. Well, guess what? Stevie got shot last night. Down the street at the 7-Eleven, Stevie got shot. Where's your God now? Where's your God now? How dare you come over here and talk about God or tell me you want to tell Stevie about God? Who the, you know, she went off on me bad. She started cussing me out. And, man, that took me out. Obviously, it still bugs me because I had this person right there, man. I could have talked to him, could have shared the gospel with him, could have shared peace and love and mercy and grace and heaven and eternity with them. But I didn't do it. I was being pandemic, I wanted to drink, I wanted to just relax, I wanted to get away, I wanted to come, whatever it was. As a Christian, now if you're not a Christian, all we obviously this doesn't apply to you. I'm talking about someone who says, yes, I'm a Christian, yes, I accepted Christ, that person. Because when you raise your hand and you say that you're a Christian, you're putting yourself on a different level. You're putting yourself on a different stage. You're putting yourself in a category different than everybody else. See, the, the things I'm talking about don't necessarily apply to you necessarily because maybe, you're not, maybe you don't think you're a Christian. But I was a Christian. A pastor, no less. Well, you pastor. And man, that that's sticks with me forever. And I, I've apologized. I've repented. I went before God. And I sincerely think that God forgave me. But it still bugs me. It still bugs me, man, that I had this guy all week. And then finally I want to snap at him. And I want to go tell him about God. And he got shot down. You got shot. You got shot, man. And of course, the enemy is going to come and tell me, Angel, you did something so bad, God ain't never going to forgive you now. You got blood on your hands. You're all messed up. You know, God don't want you. You might as well go out and do the same thing you're doing. You might as well go out and kill yourself. You might as well go out and whatever. Because that's what he does. When you do something wrong, what does he do? He bombards you with negativity. He bombards you with Drop it. Forget it. Don't go back. Nobody wants you. Everybody's going to know. As soon as they see you, they're going to know you're sinning. As soon as they see you, they're going to know you're out doing your whatever. You need to shut that down and come anyhow. You need to shut that down and read anyhow. You need to shut that down and call somebody. You know, I've never been in AA, NA, and all that kind of stuff, but they have one thing that I do like, a principle, is that they have what they call the buddy system. When somebody gets that urge, man, and they want to drink, they call their sponsor. Hey, man, I feel like drinking. The sponsor, okay, I'll come right over. We'll come over and we'll talk about it and pray. If they pray, I don't know. And it goes away. Hopefully, it'll get better. That's one thing I like about that, that principle. And I wish we had that here. I wish we had that in every single church. And maybe some do. And we're going to get there. I want that. Where when you feel like sitting, when you feel like going out on your wife, when you feel like bobbing somebody, stealing something, doing something you know you shouldn't be doing, you need to have the nerve and the boldness to call somebody and say, brother, I need you. I need prayer, man. I want to go kill this dude, man. He just cut me off. He disrespected me. I want to gun him down. Because that's how we are initially. I know a lot of you didn't grow up in that kind of lifestyle, but I did. You know, where... You know, they used to tell me, Andy, you can't resolve your problems by fighting. You can't resolve all your problems by just hurting people. And we have it. They started it. So they got it coming. You know? But of course, that's wrong. But we need that. We need that. We need to be able to call somebody and say, help me. I need prayer. Come pick me up. You know, I'm on my way. Come stop me. And go. That's why you need to be ready. That's why you, you can't be out, you know, getting faded and getting drunk and then all of a sudden somebody calls you. What are you going to tell them? Oh, I can't and I'm busy. Oh, I can't because, no, now you're mine. Now God's putting something in your hands and you're not, you're not doing that to the body. So God wants you to help somebody. That's why we're here. That's why he saved us. The kingdom of God is not here. You know, like Pastor was saying, this world is crazy right now. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on more than before. More than before. And you know what? As sad as it sounds, you may not want to hear it, you may not like hearing it, but it ain't getting better. It's not going to get better because the end is coming. Someday it's going to happen. I don't know when. Could be a year, two years, 50 years, 100, I don't know. Could be tomorrow. I don't know. Only God knows. That's why you need to be ready. That's why you got to get right. You need to stand and get right. You need to stand and be ready. You know, I grew up like that when you got to be ready for stuff. You know, those of you that have been in the military, you know you got to be 
ready. You got to be prepared. You got to be ready to stand up and go at a moment's notice. You hear that sound knock, you hear that bell, whatever it is, wherever you, you know, you're at, however they decided to do it. You hear that sound, you get up, you start getting dressed, you start getting ready, you get your weapon, you check, you're gone. You're ready. And as a Christian, you got to be ready. You know, you got to be ready. There's warfare. There's a spiritual warfare jumping off right now. And you got to be ready. You got to be ready for the enemy. You got to be ready for that attack at the gas station, that state of brothers, at Bonds, if you go to Bonds or whatever other store you want to go to. You need to be ready. Something's going to happen. Somebody's going to show up. The devil's going to send somebody. And you need to be ready to withstand that assault. You need to be ready to withstand that attack, whatever that attack may be. You know, you could be having a bad day. Guess what? The devil's going to make it worse. That's what he does. He's going to kick you while you're down. You know, but... Yeah, but doing that with Stevie that, that day, that month, man, it's crazy. I'm just sad. And obviously, it just bugs me. I don't want you to feel like that. I don't want you to be like that. You know, I wasn't... I was weak. You know, I, I, I let God down. You know, but praise God that He never lets me down. He forgives you. He loves you. And he cares about you. And he loves you. Think about it. A lot of people, you know, He's not gonna. He's not gonna be on that cross. Spread His arms on that cross. Shed His blood. Get whipped and all that stuff just to let you go. Just to let you go. Just to let you go because you slipped a little bit. He's not. He didn't do all that. He didn't come down on earth. He didn't subject himself to humanity that way to let you go. Not to love you, not to care about you, not to give you life. He came to give you life. He gave his life so that you can have life. That's why these scribes and Pharisees were saying, yeah, but the law of Moses says, Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law of Moses. He came to fulfill that. That's why he said, it is finished. That's why he said, it's a new covenant. It's a new covenant. Mercy and grace. It's a new covenant. I mean, is there anybody here who you're going to go home tonight and you're going to get a lamb, you're going to chop them up, you're going to sacrifice it? You're not. Because that's been done with. Those type of sacrifices, those type of sacrifices have been done with. Jesus Christ fulfilled that. Now there's a new one. There's a new temple. Jesus Christ didn't care about the temple here on earth. He cares about you. You're the temple of God. You're where the Holy Ghost is. That's why wherever you go, is holy ground. Wherever you go, you need to understand. You need to believe it. Because some of you say, well, it's just me. Who am I? I ain't nobody. I mean, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a evangelist. I'm not going on the streets. I'm not doing whatever. No, you know what? Guess what? The power of the Holy Ghost, Jesus the Christ, is in you. Jehovah, creator of heaven and earth, he's in you. He's in you. He's in you. Your mind may not want you to believe that. Your flesh may not want you to act like that, but your spirit man identifies with the word of God. Your spirit man identifies with Jesus the Christ. Your spirit man identifies with Jehovah God. Your spirit man identifies with the Holy Ghost. That's why there's goodness in you. You know, you imagine if you didn't have that goodness in you, how you would act, how you would be? You'd be running them up. You'd be running them up all on your own, doing whatever you want to do. Lawless. 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 That's how you would be. You know, but because we have him inside of us, it restrains us. It helps us. It guides us. It leads us. But you need to ask him for that guidance and that leadership. He is there. He is there 24 hours a day. How many of you have ever called somebody, man, and they just don't pick up? Voicemail, voicemail, well, then you know they just click you out, they declined it, they declined the call. No, it's him again, it's him again. I mean, God don't do that. God don't do that, ever. 24-7, seven days a week, twice on Sunday, you can call him. He is there, he's available. He's available, you know, and don't be distracted. Don't like, okay, God, come on, come on, oh, he's not here. And leave, don't do that, because it's going to take a minute. It's going to take a minute, man, for you to flush out your garbage, for you to sit there and listen to God. For you to listen to what God has to say. You need to cleanse yourself. You, you need to get right. You need to set yourself apart. You need to go, if you're not doing it already, you need to find a place, a quiet place, where it's only you and God. Where you can get into that habit of His leadership, of His guidance. Because He will guide you. He will answer. That's what He says. All those who call upon the name of the Lord. He will call. He will, he will call you. He will come down. He will visit you. You know, he, he will physically visit you. Not just spiritually sometimes, but he will physically do that. He's done it to me, and, and you know, in the Bible, you know, 
Well, the Apostle Paul calls himself the chief of sinners. Well, he probably just said that just because I wasn't born yet. That's why he's able to say that. You know, but chief of sinners, forget about it. You know, I was, man. You know, they, they would uninvite me in places. I, I swear to God, even as a kid, when I was little, probably nine years old, don't tell Angel, don't tell Angel, don't let him come. You know, they have a birthday party. They have a cake and ice cream and pie, and they wouldn't even help me to show up. You know? And me being a benevolent, not even realizing like I was a bad person, you know, they didn't want me showing up. So later on, I started thinking, dang, they didn't even want me, man. They didn't even want me. You know, but God changes that. God changes that. God loves you. Okay, my second scripture. Oh, one of the things I want to say that again is that with the scribes and the Pharisees, the Bible says their own conscience. Their own conscience. You got to have a conscience. God will present your life to you, and it's going to be your own conscience. You got to make that decision what you want to do for God or what you don't want to do for God. Amen. So I kind of touched on this one a second ago. This is in Romans, Romans 8.23. Romans 8.23 says, And some have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Is that what it says? Everybody got a Bible up there? What does it say? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So don't ever think yourself better than somebody else. Don't ever think yourself more highly than you should. Don't ever think yourself that you're better and more qualified than anybody else. Because guess what? All have sinned. That's why he tells us that. That's why he tells us that. All have sinned. We all have sinned. We all got issues. We've all been through something. We all got a story. You know, when God came to save us, God came to give us life more abundant. That's why he came. He didn't come to punish you. Because you know what? If he, if he came, if he came, when he came that time through, the, through Mary, if he came at that time to punish, we wouldn't be here. I mean, the whole face of it was gone. I mean, he did that once with the flood, right? I don't think he flooded the whole earth. They were bad. But he had to change that. That's the Old, that's the old Testament. The New Testament, God loves you. God has mercy on you. You know, just like I read a second ago, where that woman was caught cold, red-handed. Red-handed, no excuses. If he was going to punish somebody, if he was going to take somebody out, that was a, a perfect moment. A perfect moment, a perfect example. Oh, we caught you in the act, you're gone. <clears throat> and take her out. But he didn't do that. But this is why all the men left her alone all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, and even that one scripture I read a second ago, it takes two to tangle. Why are they worried about the female and not both of them? You know, that's up to speculation. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why they did that, right? I mean, she wasn't by herself committing adultery. I mean, there was two people there. So, but they only brought her. And I think, I mean, Pastor will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that, that part of that culture, um, they were very chauvinistic in that culture. They were more into, you know, women being down here and men being up here. That's why there wasn't no women scribes, no women Pharisees. You know, they kind of had that culture. And unfortunately, that's one of the biggest things the devil wants to do is carry that over to right now. Carry it over to right now. You know, there's women that stand up and preach. And there's many, many, many ministers that are going to say, ministers are going to say, oh, man, what's she doing up there? That female should be up there preaching. What's up with that? But you know, my honest opinion, that same Holy Ghost that comes in me, the same Holy Ghost that guides me directs me, that same Holy Ghost that gives me power and authority, that same Holy Ghost that allows me to lay hands on somebody, cast out the devil, that same Holy Ghost that allows me to go pray for somebody and deliver it, that same Holy Ghost that can be on a female. It's the same one. It's the same one. That's what it says. There's no respect to a person. You know, but... That's what carries over. That's why you need to know what the scripture says. That's why we need to know who Jesus is. You need to know that. You know, I shared this with some of you before, but, you know, years ago I met this FBI agent. And I go, hey, um, how do you guys determine false currency? He goes, why? You want to create false currency or what? I said, no, nah, man, I'm just curious. I'm asking for a friend, you know. And um, he said, well, what they do is they study the real currency. They study the real $100 bill, the real 20, the real 50, the real 10. They study the real McCoy. 
That doesn't mean they don't look at the fake stuff, but they study the real McCoy. The texture, the ink, the lighting, how it feels, how it looks, how heavy it is. They study the real currency. And the reason they do that is because when the fake one comes across his desk, he immediately knows it's fake. Because he knows what the real one is. Just like you. You need to know who the real Jesus is. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus the Christ. When I send out emails and texts and stuff, I always put Jesus the Christ. And I always write Jesus the Christ because Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is God. He's God. He's the Holy Ghost. I don't understand the Trinity. I don't understand that makeup, but that's what I read it in. And that's what the Bible insinuates that there's three entities in one. I don't understand that. I, I don't, but I believe in it. Because it sets right in my spirit, man. You know? So you need to know who Jesus is. You need to know who the real Christ is. Because there's a gazillion denominations. There's a gazillion churches. There's a gazillion stuff that's going out there. And if you don't know who the real Jesus is, you're going to get suckered in to believing something else. You're going to believe it because it sounds great. It sounds holy. It sounds great. I mean, I've, I've looked at the Torah, the Quran. I've looked at those things and... Wow, they sound pretty holy. Some of the words they use and stuff like that, it sounds pretty holy. But you know what? Jesus the Christ is the truth. There's only one way. That's what he said. There's only one way through the Father, and that's through Christ's spirit. There's no other way to heaven. No other way. There's not all roads lead to, to heaven. Like there's a, I don't know if there's a movie, all roads lead to Rome or whatever it was. But it's not like that. Not all roads lead to Jesus. They do not. You need to know. You need to study. Who is Jesus? What did Jesus say? What did he do? How did he act? How did he respond? Who is he? So that when something comes across, a friend, a cousin, a neighbor, whoever starts talking about, you know, starts talking about Jesus, you know, well, that ain't right. No, that's not what I read in my scripture. You know, I don't know what scripture you're reading, but that's not in the Bible. Because many, many people are going to sit there and try to send it that way. And I know that it's not them per se, it's the spirit behind it. You know, I know that there's an enemy, there really is a devil, there really is a God, obviously. There really are demons that run around and try to prod you and get you and get you off track. You know, there really are. And it's for real. It's, just, it's a real supernatural spiritual warfare. It's for real. You know, I got hit in the back of the head right here. Pastor Saul, it got a lot better. And with this tool at work, really hot tool, man, burning pretty good. And that was demonic. It did that. You know, if the, if, the, if the building would have audio, they would have heard me saying, Pump, that's all you got. It's going to take more than that to take me out. So you going to bring the big gun. Who's that? Come out all week like that, man. Yeah, they got a big little scar on my neck, you know. Because they had this breakout tool. And the tool was like right here, for example. I was standing literally that far away from it. And it flew over and hit me on the back of my neck. And they saw it on camera at work. They're looking at it. They're like, well, I don't understand how they can hit you when you're so far away from it. Oh, you want to know the truth? Well, yeah, it was demonic. Oh, this place is haunted, man. I need to pray about this place all the time. You know, there's kinds of spirits jumping off at this place. You know, they're like, yeah, whatever. And I said, no, oh, it's a fact. Look at the film again. Now, you explain to me how that tool is going to go three feet and hit me. It's not going to happen unless something supernatural happens. And that's what it was. And last night, check it out. Last night, me and my wife were watching, um, what was it? Criminal Minds. I watched Criminal Minds. Forgive me if I'm not supposed to. I watched Criminal Minds. I like that. But they were talking about sage, you know. And I looked it up really quick in my Bible. And, and some of the people use it to do religious ceremonies and to do other stuff, ward off stuff and do stuff. But I didn't know that. I didn't know that. But I told my wife, I go check it out. In the machines that we have at work, I found those rolled up bundles of little sage stuff that it was up on top. And I saw it one day, I'm like, what is that, man? You know? I didn't know what it was. You know, so I got it down and threw it in the furnace and I burned it off, right? And I got it all, it was like two of them, and I burned it. Literally two weeks after that, that's when I got hit. You know, and when I've been in that place where I'm working at, I kid you not, at least 15 times I was there all by myself working and I hear my name very clearly. Angel. Angel. I'm like, what the heck is going on, man? You know? And, and my wife goes, well, maybe it's God. He's trying to talk to you, you know? You know, so the next time I heard it, I go, is that you, God? Or what? But obviously he didn't answer, so I'm thinking it wasn't God. If it was God, 
he would manifest himself to me, you know, obviously he told me something, but it wasn't. It's just demonic activity jumping off at that place I work at. You know, it's crazy. But check this out, though. God is good. I got five people in my little prayer group in the morning now. Amen. Five of them. I got five people. We get up, start our work, get off the work, we all go in. We all come running up to me. Brother Andy, we're going to pray. Yeah, we're going to pray, man. Whip out my oil, man, and start holding hands, you know, and we start praying. And I'm telling you, God is changing that place, you know. So when I, whenever I leave that place, you know, hopefully somebody there will be strong enough to carry on, Amen. you know, to prayer. And, you know, pray with each other and help each other, lift each other up. I mean, because, and that's just there. I mean, that could be any workplace. You know, it's just not mine. But then where you go, that's what you got to do. You got to serve God. You know, you got to serve God. That's why you came. So don't ever think that God wants to punish you. Don't ever think that God wants to, you know, put you down and take you out and you're not worthy. You are worthy. He died on the cross. Period. That's a promise. You are worthy. You are worthy. He died on the cross for you. He wants to do something for you. He wants to give you life. That's why you came. Don't ever think anything less than that. You know? And let's go back to John. John 10.10. This is in my last scripture. John 10, 10. If you have a Bible, turn to it. If you got your phone, do that. I don't like to look at it on my phone personally. I'm just old school, man. I like my Bible. Uh, maybe I'll get a tablet. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Okay, it says here in John 10, 10. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, kill, and to destroy. I have come that you might have life, that they might have life. And that they might have it more abundantly. More abundantly. God wants you to have life more abundantly. Now, don't get me all crazy, man, thinking that abundantly means, you know, having like, you know, 10 houses and 15 cars and, and having a stacked bank account. That's not, that's not what he's talking about. Peace. He's talking about peace. You got to remember, when you're a Christian, you're a man and woman of God, and we're talking about godly, you're talking about the Bible, you're reading the Bible, we're talking spiritual. Spiritual, remember that. It's not just your clothes, it's not just your cars, it's not just those things. It's spiritual. The Bible says that God is a spirit. You must worship him in spirit and in truth. He didn't say you must worship him at that church, this church, that church, over here, that church. Because when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he did not come to establish a denomination. That's not why he came. He didn't come to establish the Pentecostals. He didn't come to establish catechism. He didn't come to establish those things. He came to save you from the wrath of God. That's why he came. So don't ever listen to somebody trying to tell you, oh, you need to be in this church. Oh, no, you need to be in this church. You know, because I've heard that before, too. You know, and finally the Holy Ghost will start ministering and tell me, wait a minute, hold up, angel. No. God is a spirit. You worship him in truth and you worship him in spirit. Now, that does not mean that there's not another building that's going to worship God in truth and spirit. I'm not saying that either, so just misconstrue that. I'm just telling you that if somebody puts emphasis on the name of the building, that ain't the one. That ain't the one. Because Jesus Christ is the one. That's, that's who you're supposed to look after, period. No matter where, no matter what. But it says here, he came to give you life more abundant. More abundant is peace. I mean, I mean the, all the stuff that we do, we're looking for peace. You know, all the drinking, all the getting high, all the women, men, whatever it is, the gambling, the racing, whatever it is, you're trying to find that joy. You're trying to find that peace. You're trying to find that contentment. You're trying to find something that just makes you happy. That's why they do it. That's why, you know, these hobby things that people have is huge. It's big. I mean, people spend a lot of money on hobbies because they're trying to find stuff. And I'm not condoning. I'm not saying don't go have a hobby. I'm not saying that either. What I'm telling you is when it comes to the spirit, when it comes to you, in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, inside of you, it's the spirit of God that's going to make you happy. It's the shalom of God that's going to make you happy. Shalom is peace. Shalom is peace. It's wholeness and wellness throughout your whole body. That's what's going to make you happy. If you ain't got much to eat, you've got a couple of frijoles on the side, you're straight. You're happy. I'm happy. That's my life. I love frijoles. I eat them every day. You know, she won't give them to me every day. So pass it to the tacos and then feed them to the you know? But yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, that's what it is. What's going to make you happy? First and foremost, it's the Spirit of God inside of you. That's what's going to make you happy. That's what's going to bring you peace. It's not, I'm telling you, man, everything else is like a bonus in a sense, when you look at it like that, but Jesus the Christ has to be number one in your life. That's where peace comes in, no matter what. You know, the Bible even says that in this world, you will have trials in tribulation. That's what it says. 
in this world, right now, as you're walking through this life, we're soldiers, we're passing through. We're not even meant to stay here. We're just passing through. I'm not supposed to set up camp here. I'm just passing through. But it says that in this world, you will have trials and tribulations. You know, I used to have a message, probably still do, obviously, but I mean, I used to tell them, hey, who wants to live a stressless life? You know, you're all looking at me like I'm crazy. You know, how are you going to live a stressless life? And you can't. You can't by having God's peace. Because it says, in this world, you will have trials. You will have tribulations. You look at the definitions of trials and tribulations, it's not fun to have a trial and have a tribulation and go through stuff. It sucks to go through stuff. But, it says, but in me, you shall have peace. Why would you have peace in a trial? Why would you have peace in tribulation? I'm glad you asked I'm going to tell you. The reason why, because you got shalom. Because you got peace, you got God's love, God's mercy, God's grace. He's inside of you. Because you need to understand that it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay with Him. I don't care what trial comes, I don't care what tribulation comes. Stand on God's word, it's going to be all right. It don't look like it's going to be all right, but it's going to be all right. You're going to get through it. And that's the key. You're going to get through it. You're not going to stay in there. You're going to get through it. No matter what. You know, if anybody ever a shaved head before, your hair goes back. At first, it's like, man, where's my hair at, man? This is shave your head. But it goes back. It goes back. You know, and that's the whole point. You know, you have keys. You're going to have a trial. You're going to have a tribulation. Something's going to happen in your life. But it's going to be okay because you've got God's key. And if you have more peace than somebody else, you've got more confidence, you got more faith than somebody else, call somebody. That's why you've got to call each other. That's why you've got to uplift each other. That's why Jesus Christ sent the disciples out in twos so they can lift each other up and encourage each other. You know, when you're by yourself, man, it's, it's tough. It's hard being by yourself. You know, the enemy can attack you when you're being by yourself. You know, he can send all this stuff at you when you're by yourself. You know, and by yourself, people give up. People give up when they're alone. And that's what we give up the most, when they're alone. When you're not transparent with somebody else, when you can't talk to somebody else, you can't be with somebody else, it's hard. It's hard to do that. But check it out. I want to be with that. You know, is that shalom? If you never heard that word before, look it up. Look it up. Look it up. I'm telling you, keep it in front of you. It's God's peace. It's wholeness and wellness throughout your whole body and your life. It's shalom. I love saying that word to people. Shalom. I put it in my emails, texts, and I write shalom. I mean, that's God's peace. You know, a lot of Jews, I guess, they greet themselves with that phrase and say, shalom, peace be upon you. You know, and that's what I'm saying to you. Peace be upon you. You know, if there's anybody here, you know, that you guys want prayer or something, you can get a hold of the church, you can get a hold of me, you can call me. You know, I'm not going to decline the phone call. If I, see, if I see your number on there, I'm not going to decline it and, you know, play it off like I'm not around or I'm not available. I'm available because I don't have a life, so you can call me. You know, I'll love to talk to somebody. <laughs> I'm just playing. I got a life. But seriously, man, if anybody wants any prayer, you know, you need prayer. Don't be prideful. You know, ask for prayer. Give somebody up. If you know, if you feel you know stronger in your life about prayer, you can call somebody. You know, lift them up and encourage them. Because um, we need that. We need that in our lives. You know, you got to come to church. That's the only way you're gonna um, you're gonna learn about God, about fellowship, about you know congregating with each other, about fellowshiping with each other, lifting each other up. You know, it's not just come here on Sundays and take off. You don't see nobody again until next week. You know, and sometimes I, and I get it, we all get busy, I get busy too. You know, but at the same token, if you have that time to see somebody, to call somebody, to pray for somebody, you gotta do it. I'm telling you, man, it just does wonders, you know, to you, man. You'll feel stronger, you'll feel better, you'll feel at peace, you know, you'll feel accomplished that you're doing God's will in your life. You know, because that's what you gotta do, you gotta do God's will. God need each and every one of you. If you all got an assignment. If you accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, there's an assignment that every one of you have. What that assignment is, I don't know exactly, but primarily is to be a witness for God. That's what He wants you to do. Go out and be a witness. That's your primary uh, assignment. And then everything else will come with your work or hobbies, whatever you want to do. But first and foremost, you need to be a witness. You need to get out of your out of yourself and get into God. Because you know, God loves you. You know, if there's something going on in your life, something you're struggling with, something in your life that seems very big that you can't get over it, you don't know how you're going to get through it, you know, don't get trip. It's going to be all right. You'll get through it. Yeah. You'll get through it. You just got to hold on. You know, there's a phrase, I don't know how you say it in English. Just, just, just hold on. Just hold on. 
you know, and God's going to see you through it. He's never failed me. God has come through in every aspect of my life. You know, he'll come through. He will come through. He's not like a human being who's going to leave you hanging, leave you holding the bag. You know, back in the day, somebody was doing something wrong, you see the whole rest coming, you take off, and you leave the guy holding the beer, holding the drugs or whatever, you ran and you didn't even tell him. He's just holding the bag. That's what it's called. God ain't like that. He ain't like that. He ain't going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's going to be there every single time. Every time you call him, he's going to be there. Every time you look out to him, he's going to reach out to him, he's going to be there. Every single time. No matter what you need, he has it. You know, I'm telling you, man, he, he is good. He's a good God. you got to believe that. you got to believe that God loves you. You know, you got to believe that. Because the more you believe that, the more you're going to walk in it. The more you're going to trust him. In every aspect of your life, he will come. You know, there was this one time I probably shared it before where I was like struggling bad, bad. I mean, it was just so bad. I was stressed out so bad. I was throwing up literally that bad. I was just doubling over. I was just tripping, man. Bad. I didn't know how I was going to, you know, go on and fix whatever was going on in my life, you know. And I, I couldn't even read. I was just crying so much. I couldn't even see through the tears. I just couldn't read. And literally, I mean, I was praying. And literally, literally, all of a sudden, man, I just literally felt like this humongous person just literally wrapped his arms around me and just hugged me and just hugged me, you know, and it just like drained all that stress out of me. It just like took it. It was a trip. And I was like, that. I mean, if I had a gun, I probably would have shot myself. I know that sucks to even hear it to even say, but you know what? You just feel so stressed, so bad, so many stuff going on in your life. You just want to get you just want to stop it. But you know what? God came through. God came through. God reached down, he grabbed me, he hugged me, man. I literally felt like a giant hug. I don't know if you've ever been hugged like a really nice one, a really good one, man, where you're just like, you just needed that. And you're like, ah, you just feel okay now? That's how I felt. That's how I felt, man. It was just like that stress just left me. And kind of like Pastor said this morning, when you gotta get filled, the continual feeling of the Holy Ghost, just like that. I mean, that happened a long time ago. But check it out. I mean, I look at that and I say, he did it then, he'll do it again. If he did something then, he's going to do it again. If he did it before, he's going to do it again. That's what you got to believe. That's what you got to believe. That God is with you always. He's never going to leave you. He's not, gonna, he's not like that. He's not going to run out on you. He's not going to leave you holding the bag. You know, we're going to get busted and everybody else got away. It ain't like that. You know, no more. <laughs> Amen? Praise God. I'm going to go ahead and pray us out. I don't know if Patrick's going to come back up. But I'm going to go ahead and pray us out. Um, if anybody wants prayer and after service, I'm going to welcome them. Come up. I'll be more than happy to pray for you. Um, you can always call the church if you need to. Get my number. Um, you, you can call me and I'll pray for you. You know, I'll find time to come out to your house or wherever. If you want prayer or something like that, we can do that. Amen. Father, we come before you right now in the precious name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Father God, I thank you for your word, Father God. Father, let it resonate in our spirit, man, Father. Let us... Let it hold true to our spirit that you love us, that you care about us, God, that you will never leave us, that you will never forsake us, God. Father God, that you will make a way, Father God, where we see that there is no way. Father God, that, that you will come through, Father God, for us, God, where everything else is falling apart, Father God, but we can call on you. We can call on you, and we are guaranteed that you, we are your children, and that you love us, and you will come through for us. Father, again, I come against every power, every principality, God. Father, God, every spiritual wickedness that will try to harm us and, and keep us from you and keep us from each other. Father, God, I break that assignment, Father, right now in Jesus' name. Father, God, I decree shalom. Holiness and wellness in the congregation this morning, Father, God. Father, I pray that they will be encouraged, God, that they will lift each other up and lift up somebody, God, and be encouraged today, Father. Father, I just pray for traveling mercy, Father, God, to get them home safely, God, wherever they need to go today, Father, God, in Jesus' name. Name. Amen. Amen.